Hi, Mike. You're the first one in so far, and uh, you're muted, so just be patient. Okay. I want to thank everyone for being here um, for our tree talk tonight. Before we get started and I introduced, I introduce Eric formally. I'm Tracy Hellwinkle. I'm project manager for Trees Knoxville and I have a couple announcements I would like to talk to talk to y'all about. If you like our tree talks, um, the Knoxville Tree Board is hosting, that's different than Trees Knoxville, the, the um, Knoxville Tree Board is hosting an event on September the 21st and our urban forester Casey Krauss will be explaining Knoxville's tree, or, tree ordinance. So if you want to learn more about the tree ordinance and how to interpret it, Casey will be there um, interpreting it for us and well, you know, to answer questions and things, things like that. So we always have questions about it. Um, I sent out an email recently about, and I would like to remind you that the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council is working with the state nursery, the Tennessee State Nursery down in um, Delano. They are in need of acorns from the white oak tree. So we are helping them to kind of get the word out. If you're in the Knoxville area, I can help because they have to get to a cooler pretty quickly. It's kind of a, you know, after you collect them, it's a time sensitive thing. So if you have any questions on that, you can email me and I can put you in touch with Ashley with the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council. And if you look in the chat section, I have um, all our information, all Trees Knoxville information is over there. Also, we are doing, Trees Knoxville is doing a community tree giveaway. I get emails all the time for people, from people who are like, I have these little seedlings in my yard and I don't want to kill them, you know, and the little, little sprouts are coming up. Well, we're asking you to go ahead and dig them up, pot them, keep them alive, make sure they're labeled. You know, it doesn't have to be like white oak or red oak. I think if you put oak on it and that's all you know, that's fine. Um, but label that and keep them alive. And as soon as we can, as soon as everything permits us to, we'll have a little event and we'll give those little seedlings away to the community. So now's a great time to start potting them up. If you have any questions about that, I have a nice little handout that I've made to kind of tells you how to, how to dig them and how to take care of them until we can actually give them away to people. So that's that, because that, people are like, I don't want to kill them. So you don't have to kill them. We're going to figure out a way to give those away. So with all that said, I'm going to introduce Eric here. So tonight we are with Eric Bridges. He's a PhD student in the Department of Forestry at Mississippi State University with a research focus on urban forest dynamics. Eric earned his BS in forestry from Colorado State University and his master's in forestry from Mississippi State University where he studied urban forest economics. He is the Operations Director for the Overton Park Conservancy in Memphis, Tennessee. He is a Society of American Forest Forester Certified Forester and an International Society of Arboriculture Certified Arborist. So that's the ISA. And Eric has worked as a forester for 29 years, including as the Natural Resources Director at the City of Lakeland, Tennessee, the forester for the Colorado State Forest Service and the forestry technician for the United States Forest Service. He volunteers for the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and was a founding member of the Memphis Tree Board. He lives in Memphis with his wife and son and I have also put his email. If you have any questions after this is over, you can email Eric. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will, um, you know, 
break in when we can and, and get those to Eric, you know, before it doesn't get too long. So with all that said, take it away, Eric. All right. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. All right, let me share this and we'll get started. All right, how's my screen look, Tracy? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate you sitting through a, a night of forced economics. It's pretty, it's pretty riveting. So it's good we didn't do this on Friday because I know it would get, it would get raucous in here. Um, so I want to thank Tracy for setting this up. It was really making it painless for us and and for me at least. And I also want to thank Nick Bridgman, who I had the pleasure of working with in Lakeland for suggesting putting my name in the hat. So we're going to talk tonight about some of my research when I was at Mississippi State. Oh, I was still am there, but I was in my master's program. So this is basically what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is a publication that just got published by or just came out from the journal Arboriculture and Urban Forestry, which is ISA's research publication. So if you're an ISA member, you should have access to this. Um, but it's all on canopy cover and, and the value of canopy cover in the city of Lakeland. So but before we get into that, I just need to talk a tiny little bit about how we calculate urban forest values. As you can imagine, they're not traditional values. They're not goods that are traded in a marketplace. So we have to come up with what we call non-market valuation techniques. So economists are really good at figuring out ways to tease out value from something that doesn't have an obvious value on its face. So there are basically two camps or two categories of urban forest valuation techniques. It's a little bit of an oversimplification, but generally speaking, you can think of them two ways. One would be a stated preference method. And there are a few of these, but that would be things like talking to people and asking them questions or putting them in a theoretical market situation and getting them to explain their values to you. It's really good for capturing values of things that have uh, non-use, non-use values. So things like wilderness uh, areas or something like that. So you might think of an option value, which is, I've never visited the Grand Canyon, but I would like to in the future. So it's important to me, I'm willing to pay something to make sure it stays there. There's also something called bequest value, which means I would like to leave this to my children and my grandchildren. I wanna make sure that there are still places for them to go or just existence value. I'm glad it's, I just feel better knowing that this exists. So those are all best captured in sort of a stated preference method because no money really changes hands except in your taxes. But where I live and what we're gonna talk about tonight is in the revealed preference methods. And you can, one, one of those methods is called travel costs. And you can think of hunting, for example. People travel to hunt. They have to get hotel rooms. They spend money on food. Um, they purchase licenses. And so my major professor, Stephen Grado at Mississippi State has a great research program on wild, on waterfowl and how much money that brings into the state of Mississippi. And then tonight though, I'm gonna to be talking about hedonic pricing, which is where I did my research. So it sounds crazy like hedonic pricing, it's rooted in the word hedonism, I'm sure, but it simply means what we value and what brings us joy, satisfaction, utility. So hedonic pricing has been around for a long time and it's usually used, you see it in housing markets. Um, and it's basically the idea, I picked up the simplest picture I could imagine. So hopefully you can see these two vehicles. I think they're identical except for one thing, which is the transmission. One is an automatic and the other is a manual. So you could say then this complicated good, lots of moving parts and pieces, and each of them has some sort of value to me as the purchaser. But if I could hold everything constant except one thing and then see how you react to that one thing changing, I would start to be able to tease out the value of that one thing. So in this case, it would be how much I value that transmission. But in housing and urban forestry, we have a whole lot of variables we're trying to hold constant. So in the structural, we, and we break these into three categories, essentially. On the structural side, we think of things like how big is the house? How old is that house? How many bathrooms does it have? Parts of the structure. 
that play into our decision how much to offer for it. But we also know that the house sits in a neighborhood and there are there are school districts and shopping centers and things that we think about in the neighborhood. We always look at the neighborhood before we buy a house. And then on the environmental side, I wanted to look at things like canopy cover and proximity to open space. So if you were to theoretically be able to have two houses that were exactly identical, except one had trees around it and the other did not, then the difference in the selling price of those two would reflect the value of that canopy cover. That's the basic idea behind hedonic pricing. But as we know, there's no such thing as two identical homes. So we have to plug in as many variables as we can and try to hold them constant through modeling. So if we were to take that same cartoonish image of the house with no trees and the house with trees and apply it to an actual study, you could see this was from Connecticut. This is a long time ago, but this was a, just a, a beautifully simple study, three neighborhoods, and the author, Dr. Morales, was categorizing homes as either no tree cover or a lot of tree cover. So he didn't go in any gradients in between. So it was over 50% tree cover or none at all. And what he was able to tease out was about a 6% increase in the sales price of the homes that had tree cover. So that's how it works in the real world. 6%. Now look at the, just for fun, the y-axis. Look what those homes were selling for in 1980, the highest ones under $48,000. A lot of vehicles are more than $48,000 now. Okay, so Lakeland is my study area, so I'll give you a little bit of background about it. It's in West Tennessee, obviously, Shelby County, the far southwest corner of the state. And then you can see the map on the lower right, the big blob is Memphis, and then there's these suburban communities around it. So Millington, Bartlett, Germantown, Carryville. And Lakeland is the one highlighted in green, and it's between Bartlett and Arlington. So it's a suburb of Memphis, but it's its own incorporated town. At the time of the study, uh, Lakeland was made up of 15,000 acres. And look at the percentages of land use below that. It was about 30% residential, about 30% agriculture, and about 40% open space. So 70% of Lakeland at that time was undeveloped. So that was interesting. And that's when Nick and I were working there. And then the population itself had about 12,500 at that time. And they were fairly young, 37 years old was the median age and fairly well off, an $85,000 a year median income and over a $230,000 home. So that's what Lakeland looked like at the time of the study. Why did we choose Lakeland though? Honestly, because I was there and I was able to, I had an inter vested interest in this, but more importantly, it somewhat represents a southern suburb. So these are 2017 dollars, but I looked at the uh, median sales price of homes in the southern non-coastal suburbs. So the suburbs of Love Atlanta and Little Rock and Nashville, places like that. And the prices of those homes were around 266,000 in Lakeland in that same time period, about 275,000. So the home values have gone up, but it fits. It fits in that window of about an average southern suburb. And then in Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi, 98% um, of the communities are less than 50,000 people and Lakeland is in that small town category. So that's where most of our cities are, are these small towns. So it fits a large group of towns in Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi in the region. Now we limited our study to the years 2001 to 2005. Uh, and the reason is because of the graph on the bottom which is a market volatility index. And as you go from left to right, you get to 2001 to over to 2005 between the two green bars. And then the 2008 financial crisis hits and housing markets are not predictable. And we wouldn't be sure we were measuring what we thought we were measuring. So we had to limit it to a fairly stable time in the market. Okay, so how we do it is like this. It's a, it's a heavily, data dependent study. So we go to the Shelby County assessor of property and we gather what's called the certified role. And that's all the sale transactions that have happened since Lakeland began. And you can get it for any city you want. The assessor of property is a very good resource for this type of information. And they literally give you a CD with all of the data on it and you go home and have to work through it. But well, we didn't need 22,000 transactions. 
we started to have to apply filters. You have to be very careful when you look at these transactions. Some of them don't represent a market transaction. So first of all, we did that filter of 2001 to 2005, like I said, market volatility. Then we limited it to warranty deeds, uh, which are, which eliminated like a family transaction or maybe a church selling a piece of property or divorce settlements or things like that. So if the same, if the owners had the same last names, um, it wasn't considered, it well, it wasn't considered arm's length, but it had to also be a warranty deed and not a quick claim deed. Um, and then single family homes, we did not want to mix up the markets for different types of housing products. And then we limited it to less than an acre because we feel like there's a different market for large lots. Um, anyway, we wound up with 1,257 samples at the end of the day. So this is a lot to digest on one screen, but this is this is not a lot for most economists in their presentations. I'm really trying hard to make it somewhat digestible and I won't go through all of these, but on the structural side, I just wanted you to see the average lot size was 14,380 square feet, which is a normal suburban lot size. About 15,000 square feet is average for suburban lots. The houses were pretty big, around 2,700 square feet, and they were pretty new. They were generally about five years old, and a lot of them were less than five years old. The oldest home in our records was 30 years old. Most of them had a fireplace, which we found interesting. We don't really need fireplaces in this area, and very few of them had pools, but that makes sense. Fireplaces are easier to put into newer homes than pools are. And then on the neighborhood side, we, we included a variable called distance to arterial, which is distance to a big highway, something that might be uh, and have a negative impact on property values. So like the interstate, Interstate 40 runs through the middle of Lakeland and it's very, very loud. We also put in a, a variable for distance to shopping centers that might be an attraction, not to have to go very far to get to some place to eat or shop. And then we included the elementary school districts. This isn't all of our variables, but just some of them because school districts have a big impact on your decision of where to buy a home. But what we wanted to get to are these environmental variables. So you'll see we have canopy cover on the lot, which just means the trees in your yard, the percentage of canopy cover of the trees in your yard. And then in three different buffers, concentric buffers, 100 meters, 500 and 1000 meters. And then we went uh, distance to a park and distance to a lake and distance to a golf course. So, and those are our average values. But we'll go into those in a little bit. So I want to show you how it works. So this is what we would do. This is a lot uh, in Lakeland that's sold between 2001 and 2005. So if Nick can see it, it's in Canada Woods subdivision. All right, so, and then I took a uh, Google, a screenshot of Street View in Google. So this is what it looks like from the front, the way we're looking at it. It's just a normal, more modern suburban home, uh, fairly large. You can see it's got the whatever requisite Bradford pair probably, it looks like over there on the front right of that picture, which shows up in the, in the slide a little bit of a gray area. Okay, so what we would do then is we would measure the canopy cover on that lot, which was zero as you could probably tell, or it looked like zero to me from that aerial image. Then we would zoom out to a hundred meter buffer and measure the amount of canopy cover in that buffer. As you can see from this image, there seems to be very little, excuse me, I have a dog. <laughs> and as you can tell by the bark, he's very small. <laughs> And then, so that, that 100 meter buffer had very little canopy cover. And then we'll zoom out, I'm gonna zoom out two more times. Then we had a 500 meter concentric ring and then a 1000 meter ring. As you can see, we start to pick up some wooded areas if you can tell from those photos. And Nick will notice that the Canada Road's running right down the north-south corridor. And then there's undeveloped lands on either side. Um, so let's see what that looks like in reality is these are canopy cover percent numbers for that one lot up in the upper left. Zero percent canopy on the lot, one percent in the 100 meter buffer. So there was just a little bit of tree cover in that 100 meter buffer and we weren't able to capture every single tree. It had to be as tall as the house or higher for us to capture it. 21 percent canopy cover in that 500 meter buffer and 31 percent in that 1000 meter buffer. So as you could tell they're getting, we're getting, we're capturing more and more wooded area as we zoom out. That's what Lakeland looked like at that time. So if we look at the entire city and at the averages, you can see uh, the bar graph on the right, there was very little tree cover on the lots. Each individual home had around on average 8% tree cover. 
and then it went up to 12% in the 100 meter buffer, 500 and 1000 meter buffers went up as well. So we started to just capture more and more of that undeveloped land is basically what was happening as we move away from that lot. So that's what our trends were in canopy cover. So this is how we do the analysis, which is where it gets messy. And sorry about the formula, but it's, it's kind of what we do. I won't go through all of that, but we build a formula. We build a model. This is a regression. Uh, and that's how we're holding all those other variables constant. So in this regression, we have the, the explanatory variable is price. It's log transform. Don't worry about that. And then you have S stands for the a vector of the structural variables. So that's all those structural variables, the number of bathrooms, the lot size, the house size, the age of the house. Those all go in there. N stands for the neighborhood variables. We plug that in. And we use a Q to represent the environmental variables because if we used an E, it would confuse us with the error term. So there's always an error term in a regression. So anyway, there you go. You have learned how to do hedonic pricing with a regression model. However, it's not that easy. So when you read about these studies that say we found 8% increase in property values, if you look close, which you don't have to, but I will, make sure they're controlling for a lot of things. So these are some of the things we had to control for. So and then below those boxes in red are the tests we use to test for those. So we use, for instance, a brush pagan to test for heteroscedasticity, which is just a fancy word you can take to your next party. And, and so we had to report out different standard errors for that. Don't worry about it. But here's the big one for us with spatial autocorrelation. And I'm going to go into that in just a minute. And since we did find significant spatial autocorrelation, we had to run spatial dependence tests, which are called Lagrange multipliers. But what all that means is our equation gets messier. And it means we have to run a different model called an autoregressive error model. And, and what is that's doing is controlling for this effect. The price of the home is a function of all those things we talked about, structural variables, the neighborhood variables, and the environmental variables, but it's also a function of the price of the homes around it. So you know when you buy a home, you always look at the comps, right, on the comparables. You look what the homes in the neighborhood are selling for. So you can't ignore that in hedonic pricing when you're looking at these values. You might overestimate the value of tree cover if you don't control for the price of the homes in the neighborhood. And then we had to include some time dummy variables because you can't use the price of a home that's that hasn't sold yet but is still in your window. So I might have a home in my data set that sold in 2005 but that lot I was just looking at sold in 2003. Well they don't know what the 2005 was. They have no idea. So you have to control for time as well. And so the map on the right is makes more sense thinking about this spatial dependence because these are very clustered. These are our sample spot, spots in red and they're obviously in neighborhoods. So they're very clustered up. Okay, so that's the messy part of how we ran our numbers. What did we find? So on the structural side, everything worked great. Everything was significant and the direction we thought it would be, except for fireplace, no one seems to care if there's a fireplace in the home in Memphis, which did not surprise us. And when I say it had all the expected relationships, that just means bigger homes sold for more money than smaller homes when you controlled for everything else in the model. And then on the neighborhood side, everything worked great and ran the, the way we wanted. We didn't know what to expect for the school districts because we didn't have kids in school there, but, um, and this is a typical looking home in Lakeland, um, a little bit more modern. They called it, I think what they call it a French architecture or something like that with some trees behind the lot. Not very many, right? Not a lot of canopy cover, but a few trees were chained behind it. Okay, but now let's look at the environmental variables. That was, we were glad to see those other variables worked because if they didn't, our model wasn't functioning right. But those work, so now we can interpret the environmental variables with some confidence. Nick, this is in Oakwood, if you're wondering where that crazy sweet gum is. Okay, so here's a table, and I'm, I know you don't love looking at tables, but these are our environmental variables. Yeah. And the, uh, the environmental variables that caught our attention, the first thing that we noticed was the first one, canopy on the lot was not significant. We weren't expecting that. People were not paying extra for homes that had tree cover around them. It surprised us a lot. But those three buffers, 100 meter, 500 meter, and a kilometer, did have a significant impact on the price of the home, and it was positive. So more canopy, more, more selling price. The next one that can cause us some confusion was distance to a park, a public park. It was significant variable in the model, but it had an opposite relationship that we thought. So the closer you got to a park, the lower the sales price of the home. 
people did not seem to be did not seem to want to live right next to a park. Now that's been shown in the literature a few times before. It seems to be maybe something with parks maybe lit at night and a little loud and people have this sort of sweet spot. They want to live close enough to walk, but maybe not right directly abutting the park. And it could also be that our main park had a fire station in it. And so it would be a little bit loud and we just didn't have a lot of parks. And the distance to lakes was functioned well and then, but the golf course was not significant. And that makes sense because there's only one golf course in Lakeland and it is on the other side of an interstate and it's really hard to get to. So it probably wasn't even contributing value to people's homes, except for the people that live right next to it. So this home here with this crooked sweet gum, they were great people. They were really fun. And I would stop by once a month and say, how's it doing? And they would say, we're hanging in there. And people would call and say, please make them cut that down. But you can tell that these were forest grown trees, right? They're tall and skinny. This was a clearing in a woods and these trees were not well suited for retention around a home. And that might be one of the reasons why they weren't contributing value to people is because they were not meant to be there. So this is digging a little deeper than on the three buffers. This is called an implicit price table. And of course, economists have to use words like marginal implicit price, but uh, implicit meaning is not stated. It's just, it's what we observed. And we think of everything in economics on the margins, right? What's one unit change and something going to do? So in this case, what you're seeing is a translation of those coefficients I showed in the last table into dollar values when evaluated at the median price or the mean sales price, excuse me, of the home. So a 1% increase in canopy cover in that 100 meter buffer produces a $301 increase in the sales price of the average home. Now that's kind of averaging a lot of things out, but you can get the idea. And then it goes up from there in those, in those compounding buffers. So if you look at the picture on the right again, that's that same lot and no canopy on the, on the lot itself, but this is a hundred meter buffer drawn in red around it. So on the right side, there's a little sliver of undeveloped land. And if you look, I fill it in with red. If that had just been tree, if that had been wooded and we had canopy cover in that tiny little sliver, that would be a 2% increase in canopy cover in that 100 meter buffer, which could theoretically equate to a $600 increase in the sales price of that home or any home whose buffer included that little sliver. These numbers look awfully small at first, but then when you start thinking about it, it starts to add up. Now I just took one lot just to the below and to the right of the house in, in the blue outline. If that had been wooded, just that one lot, that would add another 4% canopy cover to this 100 meter buffer. And those two together, that sliver in that lot, would then start to look about like $1,800 more in the sales price of a home that had those in its buffer. So it starts to add up pretty quickly and it becomes somewhat significant or substantive, I should say. Okay, so with that, what, did we, what does it mean? Um, why did people not value tree cover on their lots. This is the tough one. This is the hardest part of any study, right? Running the numbers is not the hard part. The hard part is interpreting what you found. Well, this is a aerial photo of a subdivision in Lakeland abutting undeveloped land. And so we had three, three theories. And if you look at the subdivision, there's not a lot of tree cover on those lots. So maybe we were thinking there's just not a lot of available tree cover. Maybe there just weren't enough homes to choose from that had tree cover. Maybe you didn't have a lot of choice in whether you purchased a home with tree cover or not. Another option is this neighborhood forest, this undeveloped land could have been providing sort of a substitute. So we call it the substitution effect. Uh, I don't need trees on my lot. I've got trees in my neighborhood and I can go play with them. And those neighborhood forests give me the whole utility of, of tree cover without the maintenance that comes with maintaining those forest grown trees we looked at, that crazy arched sweet gum. So those are some possibilities for what we saw. And does any of this have a management implication? So we think it does. So what we think is, in Lakeland at least, we weren't gonna pursue the strategy of the picture on the left. This picture is not from Lakeland that single tree retention effort, that tree's dead, right? You know that. Everyone who knows trees knows that that tree is gone. And it is, it's actually, it's in Memphis and it died soon after this photo. 
look at the incursion into the critical root zone. It's just not sustainable, right? That tree would have needed so much more rooting space to stay alive. But you have this nice little woods on the right. It's a pretty young woods. Uh, Nick, this is at the bottom of Maple Grove. So this little patch of woods is now in a conservation easement based on the strategies we were developing in Lakeland um, at the time. So I, I think that's the management implication is you pursue a, more of a conservation strategy than a single tree retention strategy. You don't throw one completely out. You just put your energy on retaining woodlands. Now, I will say I put things sort of in reverse order. Nick and I had been working toward that before we knew the economic impact of those strategies. So Nick and I were, I'm not gonna go into the whole thing we did. This is a whole separate presentation Nick and I have given at the Society of American Foresters Conference and at regional conferences about the urban forestry program we built in Lakeland. We built the program and then we went and tested whether or not it was working. We were just quite, we were curious, is this, is this going somewhere? Do people really value this? Uh, obviously it looks like they do, uh, but though we, although we would need to go back and check for more modern data, but we didn't know how to build a forestry program that wasn't, I mean, we were doing none of the normal urban forestry work. There weren't any street trees to maintain. We, very few parks, we didn't have a lot to do there. So we went to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and downloaded this uh, guide they had for natural resource planning. And it had a five part strategy and that sort of resonated with us. You know, inventory assessment, prioritize, develop strategies, implement strategies. You know, that's sort of our training in forestry schools, all these steps. So we took that and we sort of went with it. I would add a sixth step if I could, that would be sort of a feedback loop, right? Um, when you're implementing your strategies, make sure they're working, talk to people, see if it's working. So it looks sort of like this. This is Nick, this is Lakeland. <laughs> this is what we did. We went out in the woods and did inventory work and you wouldn't know it, but Nick's very close to a major roadway there. Uh, he's not far. This is what Lakeland looked like, all that undeveloped woodlands. So we were gathering data on what we had. We went through a public process of, of assessing that data, how the people value it, building conservation priority maps out of that, and then trying to implement some strategies through land development regulations and things of that nature. And it really would have helped if we had had the economics piece before we jumped headfirst into this piece. So, um, but we didn't, and we, and we were too naive to know that we were <laughs> doing crazy things. We, it was, it was pretty nuts. Um, so this is how it started to look. These are just messy little maps of some things that got developed in Lakeland. So the map on the left, is just a scattershot image of three separate neighborhoods that got built. And based on the input that Nick and I were able to give on those conservation priorities, they were able to connect the open spaces from one neighborhood to the next, place them all in conservation easements so there could be no development and the whole thing would function as more of a corridor of open space that was wooded. The conservation easement was important to us because it ensured some management. You wanna make sure there's at least some mechanism to do invasive species work and things like that. You wouldn't wanna set those forests up to fail. Anyway, that's how we that's how we went. So that's another presentation Nick and I would love to give. We enjoyed giving that talk. Nick mentioned that, and, and Tracy mentioned that a lot of things going on in Knoxville, and they might be looking at the tree ordinance. So I went ahead and threw some of this in, um, and these are some of the resources Nick and I used uh, when we were building our strategies. Uh, besides that Minnesota Department of Natural Resources five-step program. Um, certainly the American Planning Association has a, a good document on planning the urban forest. And if you think economists are dry, planners, I think, might have us beat. Then Chris Dirksen has a really good book called Nature Friendly Communities, and he also has a book called Tree Conservation Ordinances. And so I would uh, encourage you to look at those. And then there's an image for the guidelines for tree ordinances from the ISA. That's on their website uh, and it's a, a downloadable PDF that can be of some use. Uh, I really liked and Nick and I actually went and met with Randall Arendt or went to his subdivisions and we did get to go for a hike with Randall Arendt here in Lakeland but he wrote the book Conservation Design for Subdivisions and so we went up and toured a lot of his neighborhoods that he designed in the Northeast uh, and that was helpful 
I found that one to be one of the most helpful in terms of just getting the point across easy. A lot of pictures, which helped me. And then Sustainable Urbanism by Doug Farr, I thought was a useful resource. Uh, he's the president of Farr Associates, a planning firm, and they're the ones that wrote our land development regulations. Um, so he was a good guy to talk to um, about that kind of stuff. Uh, he's just got a brand new book out. I think it's called Sustainable Nation, something like that. So those are some resources to think about if you're looking into tree ordinances or regulations. I will say this, be careful that your tree ordinances fits into a bigger picture. And, you, and, and so you have subdivision regulation. There's a whole suite of uh, land development regulations and policies. So there's subdivision regulations, zoning ordinances, landscape requirements, stream site buffer requirements, uh, of course, education and outreach are all important components of your program, and the tree ordinance needs to make sure it meshes well with all of those and you don't have conflicts. And, and we did have a lot of conflicts that we had to work through. So, you know, maybe a road design that the engineers had put in the subdivision regulations made it impossible to retain trees, or we weren't pushing developers to build or home builders to build on conventional foundations. They were doing slab on grade, and when the slopes were high, that just meant you can't have tree retention. Anyway, those are some things just to be thinking about. And then, of course, you have to wrap up any uh, acad academic presentation with what we did wrong and what we could do better. So really, the length of time, we, we, that was a five-year window, and, and that probably introduced some variability. Uh, we really would be better if we could take a smaller snapshot, if we could keep our, our sample size up. It's a little bit hard to do in a small town like Lakeland. Uh, we didn't do a lot of work in the open space variables. We sort of limited that to park and lake and golf. And that's not really how open space uh, is situated in Lakeland. So it would have been nice to know if, say, like those private forest lands that we're going to develop someday in the future had any impact or a different impact than, like, say, conservation easements, or things like that, or farmland. We didn't incorporate farmland. Um, that would be nice to know. And then in the future, we would really like to take this and run run a property tax revenue simulator. So those numbers I was playing with, like analyze those on a larger scale and sort of be able to walk into city council with some more numbers in your hand about the possible impacts on the property tax revenue from open space conservation or urban forest canopy cover. And that is about it. We have a couple of conclusions and then we'll certainly get to questions. But um, so in the end, we just, we really teased out that canopy cover was influencing property values, but not like we thought it was. It was more in the open spaces and the in the wooded areas than it was on the lots. Um, and while that magnitude was seemed pretty small, 0.12% uh, on the margin, um, it did add up to something substantive when you looked at things like 20 and 40% canopy covers adds up to real money. And we do think that those high levels of surrounding forest lands were, were creating sort of a substitution effect, which makes it interesting to think about what's going to happen in the future in Lakeland if they follow sort of a development as usual pattern. Are we going to see some changes that they didn't want? Um, are they going to be able to capture that value or does a demographic change make that not as valuable to people that are moving in now? I don't know. So with that, I'd like to thank some people. Uh, Dr. Stephen Grado, who's in that picture there next to a a tiny little tulip poplar in Overton Park. Um, and my committee, Dr. Gordon, who's at the University of Georgia, does good work in urban forestry. And if you're a member of SAF, the Urban Forestry Working Group, you know him. He's doing a lot of work with them. Donald Grebner is the chair of our department at Mississippi State, and John Kushla is an extension forester in Verona. And of course, Lakeland helped with GIS data and the Shelby County Assessor. I can't even say how much help that was. And the register as well. The Overton Park Conservancy allowed me to do this work when I transitioned from Lakeland to here, uh, they allowed me to continue. And then of course, I wanna thank Nick for all of his help. He's the reason we had something to work with over there. He did most of the field work. And when I say we did something, it usually means Nick did it and I stamped it. And then of course, Mississippi State Forest and Wildlife Research Center for providing funding for the research, appreciate that. And if anyone, um, y'all have my uh, Mississippi State email, but if you go to our OvertonPark.org website, we're a nonprofit, just like Trees Knoxville and trying to survive. So if any of you like the work we're doing, please uh, look us up and support us as you can. How, how are we doing, Tracy, on time?
We're right on with the time. So if anyone has any questions, this is a great time to put something in the chat or um, feel free to unmute, your, unmute yourself. But sometimes, you know, we'll get people on talking on top of each other when that happens. So just kind of be aware of that. I do have a question for you. So when y'all were setting up the um, conservation easements between those three different developments you talked about, and you may or may not know the answer to this question, but was there any kind of incentive given to developers so they would develop these, you know, keep a conservation easement around the property? Because that's something, now Knox, the city of Knoxville, we're pretty developed, I think, within the city of Knoxville, so we're just trying to put trees back in. But in case he can't, work outside you know he doesn't work it out in the county because we're on two different governments so but this is something good we might be able to bring to the county government like to try to get to try to get them to put in a tree ordinance of some sort do you know anything about you know was there an incentive for de developers yeah that's a that's a very good question tracy I, and thank you so what we did was and this wouldn't be me and nick this was the planning department and the city itself was they would allow a denser development so the the the, the developer could put more homes into that site uh, if they left open space and, a, and put it in a conservation easement so there was an economic incentive built into that um, the, the, now they were smaller lots uh, but they could get more in and they could eventually they could get more money out of the, the development the other thing they were we sold them on it wasn't an incentive it was just built in was there was less infrastructure to build you don't have to put as much sewer in. You don't have to put as much road in. Things that are expensive, uh, as much clearing and drainage and stormwater to manage. So those were sort of some incentives that seemed to work for us. Um, and But we did that not through regulations because at the time, Nick and I were just working through this program. We didn't have these conservation strategies worked out all the way. Uh, we ran it through what was called a plan development process. And so we would tell people, um, again, this would be more probably better answered by the planners, but the the straight zoning, so the straight zoning would allow them, say, uh, 30 home sites on the piece of property. But if they would do a plan development, work with us on the conservation easements, uh, they might get 50 uh, instead of 30, something like that. Um, so those were the incentives. It was, it, was, it was purely economic incentives. Well, that's good to know. I mean, because, I mean, that's out in the county. What's happening is, you know, things just get clear cut. It's if you ever go into some of these new developments, it is just gone, everything. And so it's the it's really beneficial though to keep to be able to keep some of these corridors because you can't replace some of those older growth trees, as we know the value of the older growth trees, you know. I mean, to plant a whole fresh forest isn't the same thing as having that tree canopy and wildlife and all those little things that come with, you know, mature trees. So that was that's a really good. I would love to get you guys to get get to hear more about how, yeah, like how you got that tree conservation um, in the strategies in place. That sounds like a good talk. Let me see. Does anyone have any questions? I'll mute myself and give y'all a minute to talk to. But I've just got a comment that um, you know I had about twenty acres opposite my property was pristine wilderness. You know, I mean we're talking beautiful natural woodland and the developers come in and they took out every tree i mean i'm talking about there wasn't one left standing and that meant personally i would not buy a property unless it had mature trees in it i mean i, I don't know why people do i don't know why developers do that i mean and of course you know that they they completely cleared this 20 acres and then the gfc come in and he went broke and you know, he was going he had this big plan and of course the next person that came in had a different plan and oh, oh, I don't know. I I don't know how people can buy these sterile properties with no no mature trees. I I'm astounded. I don't know. <laughs> Me too. I think I think I yeah and I agree. I think I'm gonna blame me at actually at this point. I think we don't do a good enough job getting in front of the developers and explaining them the economic benefits and they will listen to that to economic benefits we me i include myself in this we tend to sort of or at least it's been my experience we tend to sort of promote tree retention because it's the right thing to do um and so you should be doing right it's and that's something that doesn't get very far very often and we all we ought to do i think is 
and, and I'm guilty of this, you know, I have this big study and I can do more and need to get out in front of them and present it to them and say, you can make more money if you could do it this way. And it'll take a few, I know Nick and I found it was, it took a couple that were willing to try it um, before it started rolling. Um, it took, it actually took a lot more than that. It, it, we got, we had some really horrible incidents. I mean, we had to have people open our mail at city hall because we were getting such hatred from the community, from the development community when we were huh. trying to implement these things. So it, it just, I, I think I'm not doing a good enough job of getting in front of people and saying, look, this is the way it would work and you would make more money. And here's some proof. Here's a developer that did it once and, and, and came out better. But anyway, it, it does, it takes, it's, it's very hard to get that first one in the ground. Are there any other comments or questions? I don't see anything in the chat. All right. Well, um, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank you, Eric, for being here. Nick, is there anything you would like to add to the conversation? Just appreciate Eric for coming in and talking to us and you know, taking time to talk to us about his study and the work that, you know, we were able to do at Lakeland and uh, how important it is to try to fight against, uh, you know, this land use. I think, you know, a major environmental issue we're having today is exactly what Mr. Henderson talked about was, you know, land use change is a major thing that we're having to deal with. We, we see a lot of agricultural or forested properties and you know, being developed and people move out to those areas, but, you know, for the woods, but unfortunately when we move out there, you know, we're not protecting the things when we go out there. And, you know, when, when that happens, we're putting something in place that's not a sustainable situation and we're uh, getting, getting something with a land use change that's not uh, a, you know, a sustainable situation. So it's, it's, it's something that we, you know, as professionals, you know, Eric mentioned, and I'd say myself, that we just need to do everything we can to try to address this land use change issue that we have. Um, Kelly, made a, Kelly made a comment in the um, chat section, and she says, great topic. I think it can encourage older neighborhoods to do more to preserve what they have as far as canopy. Yeah. In older neighborhoods, that's I think that's how come we see older neighborhoods with such great value is probably because their trees are older and they do usually have um, good canopy. So I mean, because one of the things we're trying to do, and why I live pretty urban, I live very urban, real close to downtown. In our historic neighborhoods, we have some like the ones that have the bigger trees and more trees. Those definitely economically, you know, as far as price per square foot get more money than the, the some of the areas where the trees haven't, you know, they've either been taken down or they just haven't been replenished. So, and I know that's a part of Casey's big plan too, is to get a bigger, you know, and that's a part of our thing is too, is to get the urban canopy, you know, bigger and broader and try to, I mean, when we put in the street trees, that's basically what we're doing is we're trying to kind of create this little corridor of trees, you know, so. All right, Is there any, does anyone else have any comments or questions today? Well, I wanna thank everyone again, Eric, thank you so much. It was really a, a very interesting talk, your study. You, I know that we had talked before and you said, I'm gonna to try to make economics interesting and you did a great job, I want you to know that. So um, I am, this has been recorded and um, I have put our YouTube channel in the chat section or if you need to, ask me for it. I'll send it to Eric. So Eric, you can share it out to everyone. Um, but it'll also be on our YouTube channel if you want to revisit some of the topics or some of the, I know sometimes there's a lot of information that gets passed and we don't absorb it all that first time. So it'll be there for, um, for future reference. So with that said, I'd like to say thank you to everyone and we'll see y'all later. Thank you. Bye.